In the last lecture, we looked at the diffraction patterns that result when monochromatic x-rays interact with a one-dimensional crystal. In this lecture, we're going to extend those ideas first into two dimensions and then into three dimensions. Where we left off in the previous lecture is summarized by this slide. So we have a one-dimensional crystal of atoms that are equally spaced, and the orientation of that crystal is vertical in this drawing. Uh, the spacing between the atoms is this value A, which we could call the lattice constant of our one-dimensional crystal. We're then going to have an incoming X-ray beam uh, oriented along S0. And there's going to be certain directions at which the outgoing diffracted X-ray beam exhibits constructive interference. And that interference pattern is going to lead to a series of horizontal lines, which we could pick up on a detector. The mathematics of all of this is represented by this equation at the bottom. Right? That's the Laue equation. Uh, let's take a little bit closer look at the vector addition that is behind the Laue equation and how that relates to the spacing of the diffraction lines. So let's reorient our drawing here a little bit. Now we're going to be looking you know, perpendicular to the vertical direction of the crystal. Here's the Laue equation. Let's take a look at how the vectors add up in this equation. Vector S... That's a unit vector that is in this direction, which is the scattering direction that leads to constructive interference. We're going to subtract from that the vector S0, right? That is the direction of the incoming X-ray beam. That's also a unit vector. So these two vectors have the same length. And S minus S0 is just this green vector here. Okay, now we're going to take that green vector and we're going to take the dot product of it with uh, the vector a, which represents the spacing of atoms in our crystal. The part that matters is the vertical projection of this green vector. So the projection of this vector that is vertical up and down is going to be multiplied by the length of the lattice constant, and that's going to give h lambda. Right? That vertical direction of this green vector is just the distance upward from h equals 0 line to the h equal 1 line. Now, we could call that distance k over a, where a is our unit cell vector, and k is just a constant that depends on the details of the experiment. We'll come back in a minute and talk about what parameters determine the value of k. Now, if we were to look at, let's say, the second-order diffraction line, this is where we have a Laue's equation, and h is equal to 2. Okay, so that means that the left-hand side of the equation is now doubled, and so the right-hand side of the equation must double. We can add our vectors together again. Here's the vector s, which is now angled upwards, more so than it was on the previous slide. s naught hasn't changed, and then this is s minus s naught. Okay, so this is a longer vector now, and it has a vertical component, that must be twice as big, because when we take this green vector dotted with the black vector here, that value now has to be twice as big as it was in the last slide. What that tells us is that the spacing of these lines, if we were to take a ruler out and measure them, they must be equally spaced. So if we were to move our detector back, you can see that you know, the angle isn't going to change that S makes with S0 but the lines are going to become more widely spaced. Right? This distance from here to here, k over a, is going to increase. And in a diffraction experiment, you can spread out your diffraction lines further. You can oftentimes get better resolution if you have a longer crystal-to-detector distance. The other thing that would change the spacing of the lines would be to change the wavelength of the radiation. Right? So if the incoming x-rays had a longer wavelength, well, you can see that the left-hand side of the equation increases. And so uh, the vertical displacement of S minus S naught has to also increase. So that would also spread out the diffraction lines. 
although it would come at the cost that if we make our wavelength longer and longer, we're going to see fewer and fewer diffraction lines. And if lambda becomes longer than A, we're not going to see any diffraction. Now let's look at what happens if we change the value of A. If we were to double the spacing of the atoms in our crystal, right? so this A now is twice as large as the A on the previous slide, how would that impact our diffraction pattern? If we look at Lowy's equation down here at the bottom, if we've doubled A, that means S minus S naught, that has to be halved. And so the vertical distance from this line to this line must be only half as big. And we see that inverse relationship again. The larger the spacing of the atoms in the crystal, the more closely spaced the diffraction lines. And we would get not just one line, but of course we would get all of the, these diffraction lines and they would all be equally spaced in a vertical direction. That's what the scattering of a one-dimensional crystal looks like. If our crystal is oriented vertically, we get horizontal diffraction lines. Those lines are equally spaced. And the spacing of those lines depends on some details of the experiment, which are taken up in the variable K. And most importantly, they're inversely proportional to the lattice constant A. Now, if we were to orient our crystal so it was horizontal, right, a horizontal crystal would be coming out at us in the plane of this projection. Now our diffraction lines would no longer be horizontal lines. For the math to work, they now have to be vertical diffraction lines. So we see that you know, maybe not too surprisingly, if we rotate the crystal by 90 degrees, the diffraction lines also rotate by 90 degrees. And the spacing of those lines is still inversely proportional to the spacing of the atoms. Here I'm calling that B. All right, now what about a two-dimensional crystal? So let's start with this one-dimensional crystal that the atoms are arranged horizontally. We just saw that that's going to give us these vertical diffraction lines. And the condition that leads to diffraction is going to be given here by Allaoui's equation. Now, if we were to make this into a two-dimensional crystal now, this would be the horizontal direction, and the spacing of the atoms in this direction is given by B. This would be the vertical direction, and the spacing of the atoms here would be given by A. Now, each column of atoms is going to lead to a horizontal diffraction lines that are going to satisfy this Lowy equation. And so when we put those onto our screen, our detector, we get a pattern that looks like this. In order for constructive interference to occur, we actually have to satisfy both Lowy equations at the same time. And what that means is we're only going to see constructive interference where these two sets of lines intersect. So we would get a diffraction pattern that is not a checkerboard of lines, but it is a series of points. And those points the diffraction peaks, or spots, as they're sometimes called, where constructive interference occur, are geometrically the points that satisfy both of these Lowy equations. All right, now let's look at this uh, a little bit more. Let's see if we manipulate our two-dimensional crystal in certain ways, how the diffraction pattern changes. So let's look at our crystal now, looking down the axis at which the x-rays are coming in. So this is the view of our crystal, and the x-rays would be coming in perpendicular to this along the projection coming out of the screen. So if we had this kind of crystal, and here I've chosen the spacing of the atoms A and B to be equal, and the lattice vectors are at right angles, so this is a square lattice, the diffraction pattern would look something like this. Well, the first thing you might notice is that this is also a square lattice, right? And the spacing between the points depends on K over A. Because A and B of the real crystal are equal, that means the spacing of the diffraction points in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction are equal. So we see that a two-dimensional square crystal is going to give a diffraction pattern that is also a square. Now, what happens if we were to change the size of our unit cell? 
let's say that we make the atoms twice as far apart, that would be effectively doubling the lattice parameter in the A and the B directions. Our crystal is still a square, though. Well, the diffraction pattern now would look like this. And we see the inverse relationship coming in. Because we have doubled the spacing of the atoms in the vertical direction, that means the, you know those horizontal lines that lead to the intersections here, they are now twice as tightly packed. Right? So we have halved the distance between diffraction peaks in the vertical direction. And because we've doubled the spacing of the atoms in the horizontal direction, it means that we have halved the spacing of the diffraction peaks in the horizontal direction. So the square lattice that is our crystal, once again, gives a diffraction pattern that's a square. But we see by increasing the size of the real space unit cell in our crystal, we have halved the spacing or the size of the unit cell in our diffraction pattern. So there's a reciprocal relationship between the crystal lattice and the diffraction pattern. Okay, let's make one more change. Let's say that we had a lattice that was rectangular. Okay, now the spacing of the atoms vertically is only half what it is horizontally. Right, so we have a rectangular unit cell. The diffraction pattern for this crystal is going to look like this. It may not surprise you to see that it's also rectangular. But if you look closely, there's an important difference between that diffraction pattern and the arrangement of atoms in our crystal. In the vertical direction, you know, we have this smaller spacing between the atoms. So that leads to a larger spacing between the diffraction peaks in the vertical direction. Whereas in the horizontal direction, where we have this larger spacing, we have a smaller spacing between the diffraction peaks. So our rectangular unit cell in our real space crystal gives us a unit cell in the lattice of diffraction peaks that is inverted. You know, we see that the longer we make, let's say, the B axis of our crystal, the shorter is the horizontal or B axis of our diffraction pattern. All right, now let's go into three dimensions. Now there are A, B, and C lattice vectors that describe our crystal. And so we have three different Lowy equations that we have to satisfy. So let's start with uh, a row of atoms that is oriented vertically. That's going to give us these diffraction lines which are horizontal. And the spacing between those is going to be k over a. And if we have now a horizontal row of atoms, right? let's say if we had horizontal rows for each, each of these, then we're going to get these vertical diffraction lines. But what happens now when we add a third dimension? Right? If we stopped here, that would just be our two-dimensional rectangular crystal. But when we add a third dimension, the condition that satisfies the spacing in that third direction are actually cones of diffraction that are centered on the incoming beam. And so on our detector, those are going to look like circles. And so we see that to satisfy all three of Lowy's equations, that's only going to happen at the points where the red lines, the blue lines, and the black circles intersect. For a general crystal and an arbitrary incoming diffraction beam, oftentimes there is no direction which satisfies all three of Lowy's equations. You can have the angles between the incoming X-ray beam and your crystal that don't lead to diffraction in any direction. But if you were to, let's say, change the angle of your incoming beam with respect to the crystal, what that would do is it would move around the lines or the cones. And we can tune that, right? We can come in at, let's say, any angle in theory. In practice, that's generally done by rotating your crystal. So you're making different angles between the incoming beam and the unit cell of your crystal. And here I show uh, rotating in such a way that we shift the cones 
that are represented by the black circles down a little bit. And if we were to do that, now we see that there are some points like here and here where all three conditions are met. Okay, So that's the principle of single crystal diffraction. You're, we're going to change the angle between the incoming x-ray beam and the planes of atoms in our crystal. And, and then we're going to have a detector that's going to look to see if there's any kind of constructive interference. And at some angles there won't be any, but then we'll turn to certain specific angles and all of a sudden there'll be spots that light up because we've now satisfied all three of Lowy's equations and we now have diffraction.